On the evening of August 29, 1952, pianist David Tudor strode across the stage of the Maverick Concert Hall in Woodstock, New York, to perform the eighth of nine pieces on a program of contemporary music for the Benefit Artists Welfare Fund. Tudor placed his score, consisting of hundreds of measures of rests, on the piano's music rack, seated himself, then closed the keyboard lid and pressed the button on a stopwatch he held in his hand. Thirty seconds later, he stopped the timer and opened the keyboard lid. After a few seconds, he closed the lid again and started the timer. This time he sat for two minutes and twenty-three seconds, before again stopping the timer and opening the keyboard lid. Once again, he closed the keyboard lid and started the timer. During this last interval, this time one minute and forty seconds, the audience began to grow restless, murmuring and whispering to one another about the performance they were observing. A few gathered their belongings and walked out. Tudor stopped the timer, opened the lid one last time, stood, and bowed. The audience erupted, many in anger and confusion. Had they really just heard a piece of music with no music in it? Could a modern avant-garde composer dare go that far? What the audience experienced that day was the premiere of one of the 20th century's most famous, some would say infamous, compositions, John Cage's Four Minutes, 33 Seconds. John Cage is one of the most noted American and avant-garde composers of the 20th century. To call him only a composer belies his influence and importance to the intellectual thought of the time. It might be more accurate to call him a philosopher who happened to express his thoughts through sound. The 20th century was a time of intense musical transition. After over 300 years of organizing music through common practice tonal harmony, Musicians of the late 19th and early 20th centuries began to explore new ways of creating order, structure, and narrative through music. The 20th century saw several important lines of thought regarding how music could be constructed using different means to create coherent artistic narratives. For example, some of the more noted ones are experiments with serialism by the composers of the Second Viennese School, sound mass composition of the Eastern European school, the regulation of dissonance of Howard Hansen and Paul Hindemith, and the incorporation of jazz and popular elements into art music. Several different artistic and philosophical forces came together to lead Cage to the creation of 4 minutes 33 seconds. These include a desire to elevate silence to being a co-equal to sound in music a realization of the philosophical writings of Henri Bergson, experimentation with emulating, through music, the aesthetic message of painter Robert Rauschenberg, and a desire to make social commentary on the nature and role of music and the concert hall experience in modern life. Cage's first experiments in composition tended to use rhythm and timbre as organizing musical elements. Many of his earlier pieces were composed in the style of Henry Cowell, using intense and complex rhythms and the non-traditional timbres of the prepared piano, a traditional piano which has been modified by placing items on and in between the strings to create new sounds. Cage soon began to ask new compositional questions that went beyond what could be addressed using these musical materials. These questions, and the answers he supplied, caused him to become a leader of a particular compositional and philosophical path in the development of 20th century music. While most people would agree that music is comprised of sound, Cage began to wonder whether silence had structural properties in its own right. 
He also began to explore ways to elevate the importance of silence so that it could be heard as a co-equal partner to sound in the musical fabric. We begin to hear important structural silences in several of Cage's works from the 1940s and early 1950s, including his sonatas and interludes of 1946 through 1948, The Two Pastorals of 1951, The Concerto for Prepared Piano and Chamber Orchestra of 1951, and Waiting from 1952. The idea of an actual silent piece was first posited in a lecture at Black Mountain College in 1948. What Cage had come to realize was that silence, or the absence of sound, had one characteristic that it shared with sound. Duration. This realization would have significant implications, not only for the creation of 4 minutes 33 seconds, but also for many of the compositions that would follow. But what exactly was silence? Cage began to consider the fundamental nature of silence itself. On its surface, silence is the absence of sound, but Cage quickly determined that this line of thought was inadequate to capture the essence of silence. In 1948, Cage became familiar with the writings of French philosopher, statesman, and Nobel laureate Henri Bergson, especially his book Creative Evolution. In this work, Bergson creates an extended argument, his critique of nothingness, that states that the absence of something does not truly exist, that it is, in fact, the replacement of the expected with that which is unexpected. As a result, nothingness is the failure of the mind to accept that the object or condition before it exists, simply because it was not what was expected. It is a failure of imagination. Bergson's critique of nothingness was confirmed for Cage when he was invited to visit an anechoic chamber at Harvard University in 1951. An anechoic chamber is a room specially designed to absorb as much sound as possible. It creates a space that is as close to complete silence as can be created. Upon entering the room, Cage was surprised to hear several sounds. First, the sounds of his heartbeat and his blood moving through his body, and second, a high-pitched tone that one of the sound engineers present described as being produced by his nervous system. From this experience, Cage determined that what he had expected to hear, pure silence, was in fact unachievable, and that Bergson's argument that nothingness was a failure to realize the unexpected was a truth to be acknowledged. How, then, could a composer get an audience to hear through the expected silence, to acknowledge the unexpected sounds around them, and accept them as a legitimate aesthetic experience? Cage was not the only artist working on these and similar issues. One particular painter had already been experimenting with creating art that, on its surface, appeared to be the absence of art. That painter was Robert Rauschenberg. In 1951, Rauschenberg sought to create paintings that reduced the artistic experience to its most fundamental components. These works consisted first of canvases painted white, with every attempt to minimize and reduce the appearance of brush strokes and other evidence of technical craft on the part of the artist. He later followed this with canvases painted black. Although Cage did not see these works until after he composed 4 minutes 33 seconds, it appears he was aware of their creation and was excited about the aesthetic possibilities that they created. Rather than destroying the artistic experience through a reduction into nothingness, Cage viewed them as airports of the lights, shadows, and particles, able to change dramatically depending upon the ambient conditions in which they were displayed. 
When writing about his experience of the paintings later, Cage would insist, to whom it may concern, the white paintings came first. My silent piece came later. Excited by his knowledge of Rauschenberg's paintings and the messages they carried, Cage sought to create a similar experience through music. In order to do so, he needed to devise a way to have a composition become about the ambient sounds in the room, the something that replaces the expected in the concert hall experience. Just as he was surprised to hear the sounds of his body in the anechoic chamber in 1951, he wanted the audience to be surprised by the sounds of the concert hall and the audience itself. In other words, he sought to liberate the concert hall experience from that of attending to hear a particular set of sounds, in a particular order, to one of not being sure exactly what sounds one would hear. His vehicle for doing this would be silence, which, rather than being the absence of sound, would be the replacement of the expected sounds of the concert hall with the unexpected sounds provided by chance. But why four minutes and 33 seconds? Few things in Cage's compositions occur without reason, and this amount of time is too specific to have been accidental. It turns out that Cage wanted to make a broader statement about the role of music in everyday life and how it was increasingly becoming a part of the background noise of existence. Cage noticed that background music was becoming ubiquitous, in elevators, stores, waiting rooms, and other public spaces. It was changing, largely due to the rise of recording technology and electronic means of transmission, into noise that pervaded the fabric of our lives. As a result, he came up with the idea of creating this silent composition and selling it to the company that had become the leading distributor of background music. The Muzak Company was founded by George Squire, Chief Signal Officer for the United States Army in World War I. In the early 1920s, he developed a means of sending musical signals across electrical connections, and he intended to market his invention as an alternative to radio, which was still in its infancy, 
as a means of providing music in both public and private spaces. Much like cable television delivers programming to homes and businesses through an infrastructure consisting of a network of connected wires. In 1934, he founded his company, calling it Muzak, a name derived by manipulating the name of another large company of the time, Kodak. By the time his company was ready to scale up its services, radio had taken hold as the chief form of media across the United States. Being a savvy businessman, Squire changed his company's focus to providing background music to stores, companies, and other public spaces on a subscription basis. In the early 1950s, as Cage was devising his plans to focus attention on music as background noise, the average length of compositions broadcast over Muzak's service was 4 minutes, 33 seconds in duration, the exact length of Cage's silent piece. Cage's ultimate plan, never realized, was to sell his composition to the Muzak service so that it could be played in the public spaces of the day, replacing music as background noise with real background noise. The first audience to experience Cage's 4 minutes 33 seconds did not, by and large, appreciate Cage's endeavor. Cage later described the premiere, They missed the point. There's no such thing as silence. What they thought was silence, because they didn't know how to listen, was full of accidental sounds. You could hear the wind stirring outside during the first movement. During the second, raindrops began pattering the roof, and during the third, the people themselves made all kinds of interesting sounds as they talked or walked out. What the audience failed to realize was that they were an essential contributor to the sound of the work, even if they felt cheated for not having heard any sounds. Cage's attempt to redefine the concert-going experience through a silent piece had mixed results. Initially, and even to this day, many people think the whole premise is something of a joke. We go to a concert to hear the work of great craftsmen, including the composer and performer, do things that ordinary people like us cannot do. We go to hear something special, perhaps a bit of the divine through others' inspiration. To make the experience about the sounds that we make, although it may democratize the artistic process, lessens the uniqueness of the experience. Four minutes, 33 seconds, led Cage down several different and compelling compositional and aesthetic paths. What Cage learned from the experience is that the concert need not focus on specific sounds, that it could be about sound itself and the means of producing it. If one goes to hear a performance of Beethoven and the ensemble performs badly with many wrong notes, then we typically say that the performance was not a success. In Cage's world, however, wrong notes simply cannot exist, and the experience of going to a concert need not be about hearing a particular set of sounds, but instead about appreciating the sounds that one actually experiences. The bad performance of Beethoven is, in fact, not bad at all. 
but a unique experience to be valued in its own way. In subsequent pieces, Cage focused more and more on the actions required to create sound rather than the sounds that were created, leading him into the realm of chance music, which became a significant aesthetic movement in the 20th century. Furthermore, Cage upset traditional notions of form and structure in music. Cage opened up the possibility of time replacing these standard forms, creating a new world of possibilities for the creation of structures that present dramatic and aesthetic narratives. John Cage's 4 minutes 33 seconds is important to understanding not only how music changed in the 20th century, but also how the role of music in society changed. It is a statement against the marginalization of music as background noise, while simultaneously being a model for rethinking the compositional process itself, providing new ways to think about form, structure, and narrative. It is also a testament to creative listening, demanding that the audience think beyond the expected to embrace the concert experience that is before it.